So let me start. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Grand Round series. Uh, we have a great speaker and a very important topic today. Uh, I will uh, turn the microphone to Dr. Crawford, our uh, wellness champion, uh, to introduce our speaker. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce our invited Grand Round speaker today, Dr. Stacy Smith. Um, Dr. Smith is not only a fellow MSK radiologist, but also the inaugural Associate Chair for Wellness, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Mass General Brigham Radiology. She serves as the Chief and Distinguished Barbara N. Weissman Chair in the Division of MSK Imaging and Intervention at Brigham and Women's and at Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Smith le lectures nationally and internationally on MSK topics, as well as wellness, gender equity, and burnout topics. To tell you more about Dr. Smith's numerous roles as a medical director, imaging director, and founder and advisor of multiple diversity and equity programs in her department and at Harvard Medical School would cut too far into our time um, hearing her speak today. Also, the, <laughs> the Zoom glitches are cutting into our time as well. So I don't wanna delay us further. Um, without further ado, uh, we're honored to have you here, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. And I actually feel like a little bit of me is coming home. I see so many people online that I have worked with or I have had, you know, interactions with over my time and career. So it's just lovely to see you all. And it's such a warm welcome. And I'm delighted to uh, talk to you today. I want to thank uh, Megan for inviting me. Uh, she has been a wonderful contact. And now I get Amanda as well in MSK and Haley's there and all of you in the MSK group and any, all of you who are attending today, thank you. So I have no disclosures about this presentation and we're gonna kind of jump, um, jump right into this. And we're gonna talk about wellness and burnout, some of the things that we have done that we have found useful with regards to trainees and faculty, and look at some of those current interventions and models for radiology burnout, including a, a kind of deep dive on resilience. We've all seen this definition, this burnout as a long-term unresolvable job-related stress that leads to exhaustion, Cynicism, feelings of detachment from one's job responsibilities, and a lack of personal accomplishment. And when we first started talking about this in the mid 2000s, we had not yet hit the COVID <laughs> stressor of all stressors. So I think that's added another bo you know, bonus of fun to this. When we're looking at wellness, we want to talk about ourselves as the whole individual. So this is someone who is at work, but we also have our outside lives. And there are these six phases of wellness seen in the circles around that uh, diagram there. And we do try to touch on each of these in our department with regard to faculty and trainees, but we do also realize there is so much more that goes into each human being. And we want to be able to give them the space to do those things that they love that can provide that achievement in those six areas of wellness at all times. When we first started looking as a radiology uh, group across the nation uh, at this disease called burnout, there was suddenly this flutter of uh, papers coming out. And these are just some of the that came out in JS, uh, JACR at the time. And you'll notice the ACR commission had jumped in. We've got our philosopher, Dr. Gunderman saying a mismatch, the myth of the Holy Grail. And we were all at a loss because radiology was supposed to be the best lifestyle in the world. If you weren't a dermatologist, you were a radiologist and you were at the core of the hospital helping everyone. Everyone came to you. You had a sense of fulfillment. And yet in 2015, in the Medscape survey, we saw 50% burnout in radiology and everyone went, what? It was the seventh highest burnout. In the Medscape survey that came out this year, 2023, we are the 11th highest burnout. However, Overall, we have increased burnout within radiology at 54%. And I'll show you this on the slide. So on 2019, on your left-hand side, you can see that it's the 12th highest in 2019. And surgery is above us and family medicine and uh, actually rehab, which I thought was very interesting, but I think it's just stressful because you're working with chronic disease. But in 2023, when we're trying to implement all of these changes and try to keep up with technology, we bumped up one rung. We're 11th of everyone. And we've actually surpassed surgery, gastroenterology, 
oncology with return with regards to burnout. So why? Why is this happening? Well, you know, when you look at it globally, we are trying to catch up with technology. We are, if I draw the hospital as a circle, we are at the center of that circle. Everyone spokes and comes into us on that bicycle wheel and asks us questions. And now we're available to everyone 24 hours a day. We have access to image 20 hours a day, you know, 24 hours a day. We are constantly on the go. So as we're trying to support everyone else and doing admin and doing teaching, we are seeing this. If you look at the Medscape survey and in total and other reports of burnout, the leading cause of burnout or unwell is administrative burden as driven by the workplace and organizational culture. And we've seen that across the board in many different institutions and looked at this from the lens of the business world and said, how can we learn from how they run a business? And we look at Google, we look at Amazon, we look at these different groups and we take what's been done well and we try to get rid of what hasn't been done well. And there's also several studies in the UK that are looking at this in the business world and how can they blend the person and the organization. This is just an example of a book uh, from Frank Nedevaghi from Yale New Haven Hospital. This was one of the first to put together this this full book of a uh, physician engagement and MD wellness. The second leading cause, surprising to me, it was about 40%, was lack of respect from coworkers. Now, we all think about ourselves as being kind and generous and working together, but as a group, you know, humans tend to get stressed. And the more stressed they get, some people don't behave well. It could also be that other physicians may respect us, but in their stress to get an answer for their patients because they are seeing more patients than they're used to, it may be perceived lack of respect from coworkers. We did a study on this at the Brigham looking at predictors of self-reported burnout that was published in JACR in 2020. And Catherine Geese was our, uh, is our deputy chair and she was also interested in wellness at that time, has written several papers on this. And we found 33% reported burnout. Most were less than 40 years old. So these are people who want to have that work-life balance, expected to have that, and were hit right in that crunch where technology is you know, basically going beyond us. So we found in the org organizational domains that there was a lack of perceived appreciation for work. And this coincided with that second most common cause for burnout that was found in the Medscape survey. The other thing was lack of control over their work schedule and organizational personal values alignment mismatch. And we worked on those by having a gratitude program and giving people more input into their schedule. We have an online schedule where people can actually work amongst the schedule themselves. We have shifts, we've worked home stations, we've had remote work. And many of these things have helped to decrease the organizational behavior that we saw the on the individual domains, the burnout in the department was found more likely to be sleep related and lack of self-compassion. And this is at a time just as COVID was hitting. And I think many of us were struggling to keep our families afloat. We were struggling to keep our workplaces afloat. And our, I believe our sleep was disrupted. People were moonlighting at odd hours so they could catch up with the cases. And so just some of the things that were important in that study. Other causes by the Medscape study that we can talk just briefly, you know, was too many work hours, uh, the pay. Some people, you know, often people feel they're in, uh, sufficiently compensated. And again, that lack of control, that lack of autonomy and very important things that we need to look at when we're looking at the person and looking at the organization. There's also what we call generational divide. Looking at the survey, the generation that's most burned out is Generation X. Again, the people who thought that they kind of got to where they want to be, they're ready to plan their life and they get hit with working faster and harder than they're used to. They're trying to get used to new IT systems. The millennials and boomers aren't far behind, but they are you know, a little bit better, but still, you know, it's interesting just to see this. And uh, I noticed that Sherry Cannon and Jeff Chick was one of our former residents at Brigham, gave some clinical perspective in this AGR article in 2021. And they had noticed even then that we should be focusing on different tactics for different generations. 
So if it's the mid-career that doesn't understand the IT program, give them IT at the arm, at the elbow, teach them how to utilize them, give them tricks of the trade. Uh, if it's the younger ones that are trying to figure out how to do remote work or hybrid work, et cetera, work with them through that. So find different solutions. Is there a gender divide? In all of the surveys, we have seen that yes, women have shown greater burnout percentages than men. And these are the levels from 2023, which have increased significantly since 2018, almost you know, 13 to 15% for men and women. And several studies here at the Harvard Medical School, similar to other studies in the literature have shown that women take on more non-promotable work, that women would take lower uh, salaries for more time. And more recently with the evaluation of uh, DEI factors, they find more race or gender-based microaggressions have caused an increase in both men and women uh, burnout, uh, respectively. When I first started looking at this, and uh, one of my first lectures on wellness was actually, uh, I was invited by uh, your wonderful uh, Yosami, so I thank her for the uh, opportunity to speak again. But um, I was interested in looking at different countries. Now I'm Canadian, I trained in Canada, although I've spent you know half my career in the States. And at that time in 2014, Canadian residents were 50% burnout rate, which is pretty high. I mean, I trained there. I felt we had a pretty good program, but anywhere you're finding uh, this kind of burnout. And then looking at different um, academies or education academies and what they were talking about, this started to become the hot topic as we know. And Shanna Felt, who I've listed here, was one of the first to start looking at this and has really taken the lead in a lot of this wellness work at Stanford. But I was shocked to look at the medical student burnout as well as resident burnout. And these are just some of the papers that came out earlier looking at increased depression over the years in students, looking at increased you know, um, unwellness as they traveled through their uh, training. So we as faculty or as trainees, we want to have this happy uh, you know, ability to prove ourselves, do the things we want. We don't want to be these people here on the right-hand side. So let's just start about where we are as radiologists when we're training. There's significant training, uh, changes in our early training, and they affect job performance, patient care, and physical health. Medical school burnout has been reported as 28 to 45%. That's just under half can be burnout in a medical school. And you assume that gets better because you're choosing something you want to do. You go in your residency, but now the burnout gets even higher, up to 85%. That to me is shocking. And this burnout now has been evaluated typically by the Maslach survey, which divides its 31 Likert questions into emotional exhaustion, decreased personal accomplishment, and depersonalization. And each of these can give rise to that loss of control. We talked about cynicism or inability to achieve change. We like to talk about uh, burnout as wellness to give it a positive spin, but I know a lot of the literature still talks about burnout, so we still do talk about it that way. Doing a literature search going from 2019 to 2023 with regards to trainees, you can see there's many that started out with, what is it? How do we fix it? How does it occur in fellows? And then it started going into association of racial bias, bias with burnout. And now into 2023, we're looking at what other survey factors, what other tools can we use to evaluate wellness and burnout? And more of the literature is actually talking about how the organization can change rather than the person changing. But we're looking at both sides. Looking at this uh, search, you'll see in 2021, there was this huge kind of bump in terms of the number of literature going in. And you can see the talks are occurring. We're seeing here that uh, academic radiology started talking about burnout in chairs. We talked about burnout in radiology specialties. JCR had a really nice article in burnout and P PTSD and coronavirus. And then as we move forward, there was this interesting article in 2019 that said that interventional radiology is a potential antidote to physician burnout, which at first I took it, you know, a, a back, you know, kind of sat back and thought, how can that happen? But when you think about what IR had done, they had decreased their um, shift times. 
They had restricted the amount of time they'd been on call. They'd formed a new society. They had a new curriculum. They were able to get people in early. People knew where they were. So they had actually done a really good job of marketing and controlling the situation. So that was an interesting article. And then at 2020-23, as I said, there's more discussion now in the literature about organizational structure. How can it come from the leadership down? How can we interplay with business? We have a lot of um, interplay with the Harvard Business School and many of us have gone through leadership programs that have given us these tools to work on how we can better attack wellness in our departments. And of course, lifestyle medicine, where, where were we, you know, years ago when you'd run down to the cafeteria and you'd get a big, th you know, thick pizza, you would get, you know, maybe a Mars bar and you'd run back to work. Now, when I go to our cafeteria, which has actually followed the lifestyle model, I see a lot of fruit and vegetables. I see healthy salads. And so those things that I used to grab on a whim aren't there anymore that are unhealthy. And that's actually very useful. So now I'm going to go to step into the, the resident faculty burnout that we have done, the interventions that we have done at the Brigham. And before we do that, I'm just going to look at this again, our workplace organization factors and our personal factors. And I think the one that when we talk to at least our department, you know, when we first started talking about this topic of burnout and wellness was often radiologist feels like this cog in a wheel. We have a lot of focus on technology and RVUs and metrics and profit and this growth of technology and this changing of IT structures that some people may not be comfortable with, even though they went into radiology. And learning how to work with that with the different generational divides and how we can best support people and give them you know, a, a less stressful moment. I think for us, one of the things that we found uh, was very useful in terms of uh, looking, for example, at RVUs, was we had to have everything read that was performed during the day until a timestamp of 6 p.m. And if you think about that, you can't get home. If you don't have a workstation at home and your orthopedic clinic ends at six, and those cases then get sent over and you can have 10 to 20 MRs and different, you can be there till nine or 10 o'clock at night. And so just looking at everything from a global lens and saying that doesn't work, unless you have people working shifts at night. And we tried that and said, no, actually we will do everyone until three and then those inpatients will be done and people go home at five. And we have home workstations if we want, you know, we don't go to that 6 p.m. except for, you know, 5 p.m. is our inpatient. So just looking at it globally, we found much more uh, satisfaction. When we look at residents and we look at um, radiologists currently, we're a little different than other specialties. Other specialties, for example, internal medicine, they have downtime between their rounds or admissions um, or consultation time. We rarely have downtime. We sit down and we go. Technology has made it so there's never really a gap. And what happens is that when the faculty are going crazy trying to teach and do their cases, a lot of those usual social interactions and those teaching interactions tend to take a back seat. And I think that's really what was happening in the early phases of this and still continuing. We can kind of take, uh, I guess, uh, a note um, from this study. This is Reichert et al., which I found is very interesting. It's from 2018. They studied neuroradiologists and the neuroradiologists would work 12 hour days and they would work four hours before taking a break. And their breaks as many of you often do, or I do, you look at your phone, you answer your emails or another cognitive activity, you're working on your research. Why is radiology any different than pilots? Pilots have to be grounded after a certain amount of time because they're not safe. Their whole flight crew has to be grounded. And we all have been in that airport where we can't leave. I actually was in Utah airport and I could not get out in Salt Lake airport because our pilots had been off the ground for too long. And air traffic controller legislation looks at something called vigilance decrement. Vigilance decrement is a reduction in performance with increasing time on task. And that's why they're grounded. So if we think about us as radiologists, if we're constantly looking at our screen and we're going 12, hour, or 12 hours of time, that affects our reporting quality and possibly increased error if not managed. 
there have been studies on this. And interestingly, there was a, a mammography study that showed there wasn't increased error, but most of them have shown that there is some effect on quality increased error. So we did make some changes. We limited reporting time before taking breaks. Usually on 10 o'clock, we have to go for a water break or we stretch our legs and walk down the corridor. We have conference at three o'clock, conference at noon, but we only do 15 minute conferences at three o'clock. It doesn't take a lot of time, but just enough to ping some cases, get our residents in there and then we're back. So we, we move up, you know, around a bit. And I think that's really important. The first study that uh, my colleague and I, who was a resident at the time, Jeff Gannett did, was this look at burnout and factors in New England radiology residents. And we wanted to establish the burnout prevalence and related factors in that group of radiology residents compared to other US specialty residents. And we used that Maslock burnout survey and we looked at these areas of focus compared to the residents and we found that emotional exhaustion and depersonalization were actually better than other specialties. We were very happy to see that, but we were confused to see that our residents actually got worse year by year. You wouldn't expect that. And again, it kind of goes along the same lines of uh, medical student to resident. Why does it get higher? Well, I think it's because as you get older, you want to have more responsibility. You want to be more independent. We don't give a lot of independence necessarily to our trainees. They still have to do their exams. They can't go out and have a higher salary. They're still training. And we, perhaps that's some of it. But the crux of this paper was personal accomplishment was 50%. And that was worse than other specialties. And here we are thinking our radiology residents are on top of the world. And I think they just get overwhelmed with all that they have to do. And yet they're still you know, a student, right? We all have that way. So we did a second study and this one looked at job resources and job demands associated with measures of personal accomplishment. And we, again, wanted to look at uh, this personal accomplishment and why it changed. And we actually found out that U.S. radiology residents performed higher in personal uh, accomplishment in burnout when they received adequate constructive feedback, when they had good co-resident social support, when they felt skills and knowledge building were important to society, and when they were partnered and married. So the, this isn't rocket science, but we had the data to show this, and this was quite easy to intervene. So we implemented more mid-rotation face-to-face reviews. We did that with our faculty as well, had improved verbal electronic evaluation sim uh, systems for our residents and for our faculty, and timeliness. How do, how do you feel when you've prepared a talk and you're getting ready to show it to your, your boss and your boss says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there. And they forget about you, right? Nothing makes you feel worse. So if you're you know, getting in there and you're going and you get it, that's great. Same with co-resident social support. We implemented wellness committee at the same time we did the faculty committee and increased social activity support from the department. We then built in some collaborative opportunities for radiologists and radiology trainees with other departments so that we started to shine a little more. I think we tend to get bogged down with our work and we forget that we really are that focal hub of the hospital and we can help so many people and just promoting that, that gratitude for the residents and having other departments show that gratitude is really important. Now we couldn't get out and help them get married or partnered, but we certainly you know, noticed that some support of any kind, even one person, in one radiologist's life can help them have a better success rate in their career. So some current solutions for burnout from the literature, uh, some of these you've probably already seen. Uh, one of the things we looked at was leveraging different personality types. We actually had a coach come in and all of the leaders were ass assessed and we all got these personality types. And there's the strengths of those who give and those who take, those who lead, those who follow. And that really helped to build teams. It helped to improve productivity. Uh, there was more transparency that was then done by leadership in terms of salary. Uh, we have the same salary build as MGH now because we became Mass General Brigham. Uh, we have more rewards as a group rather than individuals. So the RVUs, no one wins for having har highest RVUs. No one wins for having the highest RV is a group, but we all have to hit certain metrics. And it's as a group that that is looked at. And then professional development time. We actually hired, uh, now we have a vice chair of promotions, a vice chair of uh, faculty affairs, which we did not have before. 
and associate chairs and committees that work with that and build mentoring programs. And that has been extremely useful for all stages of the faculty. Uh, some groups have talked about these wellness days for trainees. We have what are called flex days. So they get three days to four days a year that are basically wellness days. And that shows that someone is caring. I think that's the main thing. People want to know that they are cared and they want to know that people listen. So I've noticed this, I noted this article by Bluth et al. And this is redesigning the workplace rather than the person. And I think that's basically where I'm coming from, you know, that we're, we're building the person, we're going to build the resilience, but we're also going to change the workplace. So we want to survey people and we want to act on those results. Just some of the things that we have done uh, we for team building and for, uh, we did the resident faculty wellness committees, just some pictures from the group and Surveys have shown increased physical, emotional, intellectual happiness from this. We've had faculty and resident retreats, and you can see here the high numbers of camaraderie, personal sense of wellness. They feel less isolated. Again, there's that sense of someone is there listening to them and supporting with them. The wellness committees uh, at the beginning really started supporting yoga, meditation, counseling. We actually had a yogi is one of our chief residents and she would have classes after work. Um, we are not at the extent of course of Google. This is their program where they have people working 24 hours a day. And if you have that, you do have to have perks. And this is just one of them where they have this uh, area of uh, massage therapists in the workplace. One of the things I find that radiologists and uh, trainees in radiology uh, have an underappreciated stress in is financial matters. And so we started a financial series and it was started and headed up by our residents who are now faculty and really people who had investigated this had a passion. And I found that that was very useful for people to ask questions, to not feel stupid, to um, kind of gain a sense of ownership over their career. The other thing was increasing moonlighting opportunities. And for residents, of course, this increases personal accomplishment. And that's a nice paper by McNeely et al that talked about that. But we have found in our department that increased moonlighting for faculty during COVID or after COVID was extremely useful. Most of us did it on a voluntary basis. We were given home workstations. It allowed us more flexibility, but allowed people to work when they could, share the burden. Uh, some departments, divisions uh, did it as a mandatory uh, responsibility, but um, my group did it as a voluntary and everyone pitched in. And I think there was a sense of pride with that. We implemented a formal mentoring program. And this really was useful for professional development, social connectedness, so you can see here, we started with, there was one mentor for all the first years. In the second year to fourth year, they get a pre and post match. So it's like a match.com for radiologists and they get a faculty mentor and they get a peer mentor. And a formal mentoring contract was given that was developed by Brigham years ago in the mentoring toolkit. And then they get lunch meetings that are set aside by the residency. And we presented this back in 2017. And this has been wonderful and successful and has been sustained over that. And we've used this now to develop our mentoring program for faculty, which is now being implemented in its full capacity. We, again, I said, talked about these interdisciplinary education programs. Uh, I won't go into great detail about that. And then we developed this women in radiology as well as cultural diversity programs. And these were very uh, well attended by even the people outside the area that it was intended for. You could see here, we had several of our leaders uh, from the radiology uh, leadership office, as well as uh, other residents attending and having international key speakers come and interact with the residents was a wonderful experience. And we found that we gave the residents a lot of leadership opportunity and many of the residents that participated in these programs have gone into academic leadership roles as a result of this. And we published this in JACR in 2019. We also encourage participation in programs that we may not have at our institution. Um, I put here the Introduction to Academic Radiology Program because that was something I've been involved with since almost its inception. And we found it was extremely useful for small programs that did not have a lot of access to research or academics or work-life balance support. 
Um, we're lucky at the Harvard system. We have the Harvard Macy program. We have the Harvard Business School. We have the Radiology Leadership Program. There are many programs here that support the development of the radiology resident and the faculty. Um, but I, I love these programs at RSN and Rankin Ray and AUR and all these societies that do this because it really does build lifelong connections that can help mitigate well, uh, burnout and wellness. As I said, don't forget the personal dimension. We talked about the bonus days, but there are many other things that we can implement. Some people are fulfilled by volunteerism, um, humanitarian outreach, some exercise. Um, we actually have um, agreements with the fitness center uh, that it's around the Brigham. So our trainees can jump out if they want during you know certain parts of the day or after hours and they get a decreased uh, payment scale, which is really nice. So we need to model all of this as faculty, even though we're working through it ourselves. Because if we aren't well, our residents aren't well. And I, I think that is one of the main points of this portion of the talk is that we really need to work on it ourselves. Now, the last portion is gonna be on resilience and organizational structure. And this is really the ability to bounce back in the face of adversity. And I think the best example of this is COVID. And we're seeing a resurgence of COVID out here. I don't know if you guys are as well. So we're doing that, you know, balancing around, but this time we're prepared. We have our home workstations. We have our set rooms where we're outside the hospital that people can read if they're still well enough, but they're still positive. Um, we're able to care for each other better. And I think we've been able to adapt because we became more resilient in this difficult time. And we're seeing more of talks like what I'm doing today. I like this one, psychological uh, PPE, building resilience in the face of crisis. But um, as we start talking about this, I just want to touch base on this particular topic that's uh, talked about in a really nice one hour topic. Uh, that's on the ACR wellness site. It is by Dr. Robert Brooks. He is a Harvard psychologist. And he states that um, science tells us that some children uh, develop resilience or the ability to overcome serious hardship, whereas others don't. And one way to understand this is looking at this seesaw or balance scale. Some children are given these coping skills and psychological skills that can help them have a positive outcome no matter how many negative things have come their way. And when they did research, they found that the single most common factor in these children to develop resilience is at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or other adult. And this helps them to be able to solve you know, the issues. It helps them to control attitudes have a positive mindset. And when we think about this in our departments, just one person can make a difference. And that's why mentoring programs are so important. Why buddy systems are so important when residents come into your system. Why having an older faculty buddy up with a junior faculty who's joined your group, just one person. And I know in my life, just one person person that I could bounce things off when I was, you know, confused or anxious or just needed someone to talk to, I could be myself with. Very important. So the number one predictor of human resilience is interpersonal support. And we don't think about a, that a lot. I think we're here as we're working with IT, we're working with our images, but we are human. And all of these things contribute to our human resilience, but really just having that knowledge of trust. And that way we become more resilient. We're calm, we can bounce back, we recover quickly, uh, we can manage our work and home demands. And really it's how we use our network that's very important. So we can be per personally strengthened to overcome challenges if we're resilient. Uh, being resilient doesn't make your problems go away. It just helps you to cope with them, I think, and adjust. And these are just some characteristics of resilient people. And they often uh, say that people who volunteer, um, who work in a number of networks, for example, uh, have a stronger resilience. Uh, people who can adapt and accept change go through many different characteristics. People who've moved around a lot. You see a lot of the kids who grew up in army backgrounds, they move in a lot of different areas. And they've chosen you know, to have an attitude that accepts change because they haven't really been able to accept or change their way. And it's actually been a wonderful thing for them and keep things in perspective. So bouncing back as radiologists is very critical to our patient care, our professional fulfillment and boosting sustainability. And remember, we were considered the most resilient people and the best lifestyle for so long 
but our increased level is now due to change in healthcare, escalating time pressures, our patient loads are increasing. And as we saw that number one is that clerical duties paperwork. And for us, it's not paperwork, maybe it's email. How many of us that look at our email and think, oh, I've spent a whole academic day checking off my emails. We'll set a time and do email and then close it, right? So you have to take care of your physical health, your emotional health and social health. And these are our personal steps. You wanna exercise, you wanna have a positive uh, perspective, reduce exposure to stressors. If someone irritates you and really doesn't make you feel like you're the best you could be, try to find committees, maybe that person's not on. Remember to recharge. Some of us get so bogged down by stress. We say, oh, I just can't do anything this weekend. I have to do this, 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 this. Doing that recharge will help you be better at getting that paper together. And our leadership actually established policies that limited work-related emails on weekends and after hours. And we get that little note across that says, could you send this at a different time frame, please? And it just helps us to remember. Remember giving back or volunteerism, humanitarian work helps you to remember what we're here for, which is the patients, the patients and their families. And we sometimes forget that when we sit in our small rooms and look at one other person for the rest of the day. This is just a, a slide to show, uh, this is an article by Fishman et al that shows these seven characteristics that are needed to cultivate personal resilience. I'm just gonna focus just quickly at the one at the bottom in the middle. I think as we start our careers, we say yes to everything. And what we need to realize is pick things that are meaningful for you once you kind of become more established, that way you don't get bogged down. The stress becomes less and you can keep yourself on the right track. And as I said before, don't just grow a thicker skin when you're faced with a challenge that just keeps cropping up. That person or thing that's causing that issue may need to be removed um, from your path to have a positive outcome. Does that mean you change jobs? Does that mean you change roles? Does that mean uh, you, you have a greater network that you work with? Um, you ha sometimes have to figure that out. Um, Scott Taylor, who is uh, an organizational behaviorist here at Babson College, talks a lot about resilience, and he is one of the speakers in the Radiology Leadership Institute. And we uh, are very lucky here at Brigham that we are part of what's called the SPEAR uh, Leadership Accelerator Program, which is like a mini RLI that we started a couple of years ago, where we go to go to Babson and get these lectures face-to-face -face and team building and, and working on projects similar to what you do in an MBA program. And we learned that this resilience needs to be done by the individual and the organization. And so the healthcare organization needs to build this practice environment and foster this culture of wellness. And the crux of it is to help physicians do what they do at the top license of what they do. So for us uh, in radiology, for example, we as radiologists and our fellows did all the protocols and we stopped doing that. The, you know, like the knees, the hips for MSK all have gone to the technologists and we're putting more of those very bread and butter things to radiology or to the technologist. We've also got an RA doing barium studies. We've got PAs doing the workups for biopsies. And so it's, it's allowing a little bit off our plate at all times. And it started from the organization looking at how they can rebuild the process um, building resilience within an organization is really for the purpose of building joy in a radiologist. And we look at these business principles in order to do this. And this was based on the lean principle of respect for people. And this is Fishman again, et al. And they said, in order for this to work, you really need organizational changes. It can't be just one thing. You can't just have a harbor cruise and say, we're well. There's many things that you have to put in place. So developing a culture of organization resilience comes from the leadership. And it usually in a team, the members of the team like to think of themselves as mirroring that leadership. So if leadership shows optimism, decisiveness, integrity, and open communication and involves everyone. So we put together uh, an example, uh, committees during COVID and we pulled from staff and technologists and residents and faculty, and we mixed so there was a, members of each on every committee that we needed to look at when we were reorganizing our department. And we got so much done because we had people from every walk 
in our department on the same playing field. And we also found that from leadership, people sharing stories of vulnerability, things that they didn't feel that they understood, could someone else give a personal experience? It made things vulnerable and real and made people jump to try and help. How can we make this better? So again, that interpersonal support is really important. There are four categories or drivers that contribute to stress in our workplace. You know, there's individual personal factors. There's our small work unit or our division. Often in an organization, you've got bylaws and policies, you've got the compensation, HR coming at you, right? And you've got the insurance companies, things that you are trying to control but can't necessarily all the time. And then of course, national trends. And we must work together to try and figure out how this works best. So how we found, and it goes along with the slide on your left, is leadership you know, changes. And as leadership you know, people come through in radiology, we have to support them. So often as radiologists, we aren't trained in management. We aren't trained in business, but we learn as we go. So you need to be skilled in change management communication. You have to understand inclusion and you understand what drives staff engagement. And this is, again, asking people, going to the reading room, talking to them, asking the text, what's helpful. Let them be valued and be heard. So that eliminates that negative workplace. And then define your practice mission. We didn't know what our mission statement was several years ago. And we were asked on a survey and none of us knew. So we actually had departmental meetings specifically on the mission statement and all the tiers. And we all realized we are certainly patient centric. And ours is at Mass General Brigham, our patients come first. And I know we're about to close on time, but I've just got a little bit more to go. So bear with me. I'm just going to go through this one. Um, we're going to talk about, this is um, something called the Robertson Cooper model for building resilience. There are four things that are involved in this, and we're going to start with adaptability. I'm going to give an example. Radiologists are interrupted often every 12 minutes or so, as per one study down here by Ratwani, but we've also studied it in our group. And that's probably generous. I think we're interrupted actually more commonly, but it usually takes you about 23 minutes to reorient to your original task. That's a long time. So if you're multitasking and you're getting interrupted, that's bad. You need to compartmentalize your cognitive load. So for us, we started in our MSK reading room. We had a reading room assistant filters our calls. Then we got a, a phone tree to even help that. And we have a specific time block for consults. We have detachment breaks where we walk, or you can do this thing called the Pomodoro technique where you Focus on something for 25 minutes and then take a 25 minute break. And then you do that four times and then take a 10 minute break. And you actually get a lot more done. I remember Donna Blankenbaker um, over at Wisconsin gave a talk about how she writes her papers. And it was the Pomodoro technique. She didn't use that, but I thought it was really interesting that that's what she did. You know, you might have ergonomics, you might have these standing tables. We all have standing tables now, we all have ergonomic chairs. And we learn how to do this and be compassionate with ourselves. The thing on this slide that I want to note is that you want to support mentorship, you want to be positive and patient-centric and have purpose, and you want to note contributions that are positive. And we started this highlights in clinical excellence and gratitude, where people could put in faculty's names, whether it's a great case, a clinical innovation, a great patient experience, and then they would receive a note or we would put it in our newsletter, and it gave people just a little bit of something to brighten their day. And remember too, that we wanna reward the group, not the individual all the time. Certainly individual awards we do, but I think it's really important to say, you know, as a group, you pulled together, there was teamwork, you know, we got rid of discrimination and harassment. We want to build confidence. Uh, you don't wanna be drowning in work all of the time. And all of these things that talk about social support are extremely important, especially being able to discuss your thoughts openly with others to address issues, to not feel threatened when you ask these questions. Bouncing this off and sharing mistakes is very important. I think we're gonna, I'm running into a, a thunderstorm here, so I'm, I'm getting down to my last slides before I might get cut off. Uh, I, during the COVID time, as I said, our organization became uh, very centered on how to become more adaptable and forming these task forces. And at the same time, the Canadian Radiology uh, Association was doing the same thing. And they found the key messages over here on the left that we found 
when we were doing this for Brigham and MGB, that radiology was really adaptable because of the integrity of the staff. People jumped in to help. But the most important thing that allowed people to work and build resilience and recover was communication. So we built communication. We, we laid it out. Where does it go in the divisions? Where does it go in the department? Where does it go between trainees? Where does it go in every of the silos, education, leadership? We had interdisciplinary imaging teams for wellness, for operations, for communications, for call. I mean, everything had this interdisciplinary workforce, we eliminated redundancy. So we got a central scheduling service, one imaging repository, one unified PAC system between Mass General and Brigham. We had different ones before that. Everything can now be visualized across the whole network. We had new schedules because we had home workstations. We could do shift work. We could do part-time work. We could work from home periodically. We read out through teams with videos. We learned how to adapt and certainly supporting many different things. Some of the interventions to date, um, every year Brigham does the Stanford survey. And we initially, when we first started doing wellness activities, we concentrated on faculty lunches, wine and cheese, holiday parties, harbor cruise. And we did a little bit of the HR or not HR, the electronic record training to make that easier. And we thought this is going to make the world go better, right? And we found that the burnout really was unchanged after all that input. And we thought, what's going on? Like, we have to figure out. And what we found is that, you know, sometimes institutional culture change is better than just the department. So everyone has to be involved in that. And then it kind of Peter you know, trickles down. But we found that systems, IT, workday organizational change, and flexibility were much more effective and hence the workstations, hence the hybrid work, hence, you know, the different work schedules, the, you know, the raising or the earlier timestamps. Then we found that um, non-radiologists versus radiologists. We found that radiologists needed to have some better appreciation. So we started the gratitude, you know, the, in the newsletter and the, the anonymous gratitude. Leadership relationships needed to be better. So we opened up and were more transparent between the lines of command and just concentrated on the meaningfulness of our work. So every meeting we have, we talk about how many patients we've helped, what is the status in our hospital, you know, how have we helped people you know, being discharged, go into cancer diagnosis. So to date, I think some of the most important things we've done, we've highlighted the homework stations, remote work, Ergonomic interventions, we've started doing that with a couple of divisions and radiologists have already felt that someone cares. We're now doing it for the whole department. We've decreased focused meeting times. If you wanna set up a meeting, you gotta shorten the time frame and have a very short agenda and don't have people hang on for hours at a time. Um, Cross-sectional interdisciplinary teams, we talked about using non-radiologists. And every time I give this talk, it's interesting, people come up and they say, but why aren't people just hiring more radiologists? That's the answer. And we talked about it in our departments, will it cost money and do we have the need? And this year they decided we're gonna do it. So we've started hiring up and people were willing to take maybe a little bit less in their bonus or no bonus in order to have a better life. And what we found, the volumes have gone up, so we have more money. We probably do have the bonuses, but now we have more people to work with, and we can have that flexibility. And people are starting to teach again, like we used to. And there's more people to volunteer if there is moonlighting. Our moonlighting is starting to dry up because we're now be able to do the work during the day. But I think it makes a workplace a better place. So I would say workplace and design and culture or external affairs have as much need for improvement as the personal resilience building. So we put equal emphasis on both. And I think the bottom line is showing we care. Remember, we're here for patients. We hope our leadership is here for us. We should be there for residents. And it all it takes all of us. We all have ideas and things we want to implement. Um, I've seen it come out well. I've seen it not come out well. And we just need to keep trying these, these um, interventions and listen to those around us. And I, I thank you so much. I know that's a lot of information in a very short time. Uh, and I will stop there and thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, it's really, really specifically great to hear the things that you've done in your department and, and how they've been working out. And we appreciate so much that you shared that with us today. I don't know if you have time for questions or if you need to hit the road because of the thunderstorm. <laughs> Yeah, it is thunderstorm. My husband actually stopped in and said, we're in a th severe thunderstorm warning until 3 p.m., just FYI. And so <laughs> you can see the thunder and lightning outside, but I'm, I'm still live. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. If you will on, open the Q&A box, there's actually a question from Dr. Winkler. Okay. Good day. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is a great question. So um, it says, um, does the resident involvement in leadership and other activities um, lead to variability of presence? It, um, so I was involved in the residency program for about 15 years, and we were very careful to make sure that they did not lose the academic training that they have in the reading room. So what they often have is this um, kind of educational learning time that they can take off. And so it could be either during the, the noon hour time or on a rotation where they can do their work in the morning and then they get a half an hour to go and do this. But most of the times it's done during the morning before work and at noon. The only thing that's done during the workday really is the medicine or the medical student training. And they are given time off the schedule to do that as part of their um, outreach and teaching and uh, learning experience. So it's actually built in to the program itself, which I think is really important because I think in years long ago, you know, residents would go do something and they wouldn't be on service for the whole day and they would lose out in that educational service component. Um, and so this is a nice balance. And what is it, the, does the variability in fact, um, yeah, I, f I find that, so with our residency, they, if they're gone, they often have someone fill in for them. So there, there was usually a backup. So if you're gone for a longer period of time during a resident rotation, you do have to have someone fill in for you. Some faculty, it doesn't bother them. They'd rather just work on their own, but certainly many faculty want that trainee in the room. Um, so that's that's one of the things we've noticed. The other thing I was talking to Akram at the beginning is we have a ton of fellows at the Brigham. And so while we have 40 uh, residents, we can have almost a hundred fellows. So when a resident goes to do something, we have a fellow and that balances. And when a fellow might be over doing some strata simulation training, we have the resident. So there's always a trainee there. And that was some of the checks and balances that we decided when we, as a department, decided to increase our, our fellowship numbers was trying to how do we balance the training and the education and the experience for our trainees. Ah, yeah, so to attract, so the next question is, what are some of the strategies Brigham has applied to attract or retain great faculty? Um, we actually, it's interesting you ask that because that's what we're doing. You know, we've been working on the last couple of months. We've noted that the job market is so hot. We do not have the capability of competing with the 12 week vacation that you've listed here. Like it says it's tough to compete with 12 plus weeks vacation. We don't have that. We have a good vacation package, but what we have found has brought people to us during this time is this added value. So for example, we have centers in our um, hospital and radiology program, for example, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine that looks on decision support. Um, it looks, it's a very known research, well, you know, established research group and incoming applicants can join that and they get time off during the first one to two years to work in research in that area, as well as work in their clinical area. So there have been some of these added value offers to applicants to entice them to come, um, they, you know, to give them that leverage 
Uh, it's similar to back in the day when scientists would come to an institution, they would give them three years of grant support, for example. We don't do that to that extent, but certainly if someone comes and they have an interest, they are already locked in to that area. They are given time to grow that and prove themselves, and then they're back into the regular group unless they get grant support and things like that. So I think um, each department has to find something that's unique about itself, uh, and that's what we have found. But you're right. I mean, this is a crazy time. I mean, we have jobs in academic areas. We have a job that's a, um, it's called the Enterprise Service Group, which is ESG, which is a community group that's built by MS or by the Mass General Brigham Group. So it's like, but it's affiliated with the academic group. And they have they don't have um, teaching responsibilities, for example. So if someone comes and say says I want to work at your institution, but I don't want to teach residents at this point, I just want to do a lot of volume. They could go to the ESG. Others could say I want to do a hybrid, and they could say okay, two days you're working at that enterprise group, two days you're working at academic. Um, so it's a long answer to that one. I hope that answers. Thanks, Haley. So I'm curious, have you guys, what have you been doing then? Like you're, you're out there in this great place. I would assume people are clamoring to get in the door, um, but as you are competing with the private practice groups that would have that large vacation number, right? Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate this. And I know you have to go back to your workspaces, so. Thank you so much. Great. I look forward to see you guys in person. So Amanda, we will touch base. I'd love to pick your brain about things. It'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Thank you. Great. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye.